Hello. So a little bit ago I had made a comment uh, on somebody's question about how to choose antibiotics for empiric coverage. Uh, and it seemed like quite a few people um, appreciated uh, my comment about how I go about choosing uh, antibiotics for empiric coverage of infections. And a couple of people uh, seem to support me going ahead and trying to make a video going through this as well. So that's what this is. Um, so when we think about an infection, um, basically what that is, is that a bacteria has moved from some place where it lives normally into an environment where it shouldn't be found. And um, let's be honest, the vast majority of the human body is sterile. Uh, there's really only three places uh, in the body where you find bacteria normally. Um, so the first place uh, is pretty obvious. Bacteria live normally on the skin. Um, the next place that we find bacteria normally are in kind of the mouth, nose, throat area. So that's the oropharynx. And then um, the last place that we normally find bacteria are in the GI tract. Um, and that's really it. Those are the only three places that we find bacteria normally on the human body. So those are the only places that infections really come from. Okay. So then, um, you know, if I'm faced with a patient who's got an infection, my first step is to try to determine which one of these three places, the skin, the oropharynx, or the GI tract, um, which one was the source? Where did this infection originate? Where did the bacteria come from? Um, and then once I've decided which one I think the bacteria came from, um, then I can go about choosing my antibiotics to target the type of bacteria that are typically found there. So on the skin, if I determine that the bacteria came from the skin, um, the bacteria that live on the skin are normally gram positive. Gram positive. And then once I've determined that indeed we're dealing with skin gram positive, I do kind of make a branch point here. Do I have to worry about MRSA or not? MRSA yes or MRSA no. Okay. Um, If I determine that yes, indeed, I do have to worry about MRSA, then we're looking at our, back, our antibiotics that have activity against MRSA. That's like Vank, Bactrim, Clinda, um, and if we say no, we don't have to worry about MRSA. Um, then things are a lot easier. A lot of our penicillins are good here. Um, or like our first gen cephalosporins. Okay. So that's kind of, if that's for the skin. Um, oropharynx. I do, when I think about the oropharynx, I do make a little bit of a branch here of if I think it's mostly mouth type bacteria or if it's lower. Um, like throat, and by lower I mean more like throat, nose area. Um, the mouth really has kind of a few gram positives. There's a few gram negatives and anaerobes. Most of these gram positives, gram negatives, and anaerobes are actually still um, usually fairly sensitive organisms. They're kind of just simple. <laughs> um, so penicillins actually still work really well in the mouth. Um, if we're dealing with a little bit lower, again, Gram positives, gram negatives, a little bit less on the anaerobes. Um, so,
not quite as many anaerobes in sort of back of the throat, nose. I mean, there's a lot of oxygen flowing around there as you breathe. So not quite as heavy on the anaerobes. So here, um, because the gram-positive and gram-negative organisms occasionally carry a little bit more resistance, um, I tend to reach more towards um, antibiotics that have like a beta-lactamase uh, inhibitor um, or something that can get around like a beta-lactamase. So like amoxclav, um, ampsilbactam, uh, and then also like your third generation cephalosporins are great here as well. Um, so that's kind of that. Um, the other one that you can lump in here that has good coverage in your sort of run-of-the-mill gram-positive, gram-negative spectrum uh, would be something like um, levofloxacin. Um, that usually does also have some pretty good coverage for gram-positives and gram-negatives. Um, so that's something else to consider. Uh, although I tend to not use it as much just because resistance develops a little bit easier to um, your fluoroquinolones. So I don't use it as much, <laughs> but that's me. <laughs> um, when we get into the GI tract as our source, this is where things get kind of a little bit more serious. We have gram positives. <gasps> Gram negatives, anaerobes, lots of them. So here in the GI tract, um, I have a little bit of a branch point as well again. And it has to do with the gram negative organisms. Do I need to cover a pseudomonas or not? Pseudomonas, yes or no? If we're looking at pseudomonas, yes, we really need an antibiotic that has anti pseudomonal properties. So, Piptazo, um, Cefepime. or like a carbapenem, like meropenem. If we say pseudomonas, no, we don't need to worry about pseudomonas. Well, then we're kind of back up um, to similar, back, uh, similar, similar antibiotics that we'd use for the oropharynx. So your amsalbactam, your amoxclav, Um, ceftriaxone, the third generation cephalosporin. Um, so that is kind of that. Um, so as far as how to determine um, whether or not you need to worry about um, some of these more, you know, some of these branch points here. For instance, if you need to worry about pseudomonas, yes or no, um, you can look at the patient's history. Um, some of it's also kind of guided by like how much contact with the healthcare system has the patient had, or um, uh, what like what sort of your local um, patterns of infections that you see, or sometimes how sick is the patient, i.e., how bad would it be if you were to miss. Um, not covering for like a pseudomonas. Um, same thing with like on our skin uh, source uh, question of do we need to cover MRSA, yes or no. Again, this kind of goes back to sort of some patient factors. You know, does this patient have a history of MRSA infections? If they do, then absolutely we have to worry about MRSA. Um, if they don't, then great, we don't have to worry about MRSA. You know, we may not have to worry about MRSA. Have they had significant contact with the healthcare system? Um, if they have, we may have to worry about MRSA a little bit more. Um, now, 
I know I said that vast majority of infections come from one of these sources, so I'm going to go through some examples really quickly. So, um, so skin, OP, and then GI. So some easy ones like cellulitis is obviously skin. Um, think of GI tracking, you think of like diverticulitis. Oropharynx, um, like sinusitis. Dental. It's like a dental abscess or something like that. Um, an ear infection. Um, you know, GI tract, if you have like cholecystitis. Uh, many UTIs are GI in source. But I'll also say sometimes they can come from the skin. So there's a few infections that do have some overlap. So UTIs could be GI or skin, um, especially if there's like a catheter involved or something. Um, other skin, line infections. Um, another skin source uh, actually is often like osteo. Um, then, like, uh, you have, like, a wound infection. Often that you're thinking of skin uh, skin type bacteria for, like, a wound infection. Um, oropharynx, one of the ones that we don't always think of, meningitis. This actually comes from the oropharynx. Um, remember how uh, thin that cribriform plate is. Um, and how close their connection is between the ears and the brain. Um, so that tends to be uh, where bacteria that cause meningitis come from. Um, the one caveat being, if you had, if you have meningitis in a patient who just recently had brain surgery, you also have to worry about skin infections. So. They just recently had brain surgery, meningitis also kind of, then you have to cover skin. Um, remember the GI tract, another weird one uh, that we don't always think about, neutropenic fever. That comes from the GI tract. So that is that patients who are neutropenic, um, they lose integrity of their um gut mucosa and bacteria transmigrate from their gut into their bloodstream and can cause neutropenic fever. Uh, mm -hmm, I'm trying to think if I've missed any other major or common infections. Pneumonia comes from the oropharynx. Um, you know, community acquired, you typically have to cover for your gram positives and gram negatives, a little bit less uh, worried about your anaerobes. Um, and if you're worried about like an aspiration pneumonia, then maybe you do want to cover some more for your anaerobes. Um, you know, thinking about some of those like anaerobes that come from the mouth. Um, hmm. Oh, another one that is pretty uh, interesting, endocarditis. Where do we put that one? So, if you have endocarditis um, in a patient who is an IV uh, drug user, it's coming from the skin most likely. Versus if we're thinking about someone who's got uh, endocarditis and they have structural heart disease, a little bit more often you're actually thinking about that coming from the oropharynx. Drug use, structural heart disease. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Trying to think any 
I think that hits a lot of kind of common high point infections and how they kind of fall out um, in sort of how I determine where their source is. And then once I know kind of what the source of my bacteria is, then I go ahead and I choose my empiric coverage um, based off of what type of bacteria I typically find there and what I need to cover. So again, kind of going up to this uh, sort of general uh, thought process of, you know, what type of organisms are typically found in that location and then um, what do I want, and going from there to determine what I want to cover. So I hope this helps you guys. Let me know. It's my first little teaching video. So <laughs> thank you.